participating in the session about my hometown, Detroit. So I want to just congratulate all of you for coming to the session because it is the very best session of anything you have gone through the whole conference. So thank you. So let me just uh, give a few words um, of opening to just talk a little bit about the session and what's been going on in Detroit. Um, and then I'm going to turn it to my colleagues and we're going to um, jump into a conversation and we hope that we'll be able to save some time so that it really is a dialogue, not only amongst us, but we want to invite you into this dialogue and into what we believe is a great opportunity in Detroit. So in 2009, that 2008-2009 uh, season, the world really mourned the city of Detroit. Our auto industry was faltering, the housing market was collapsing, blight was encroaching and spreading, crime was peaking, and our city government essentially were, was buckling underneath um, the weight of its debt and its legacy costs. Then in July 2013, Detroit became the largest city in America to file for a Chapter 9 bankruptcy. And what appeared to be a death knell really turned into a transformational um, pivot point in our city's history. And it's a great opportunity that has really cemented the city's potential as a, a, a major comeback story for our country. Now this story has consisted of some really interesting things, including a public-private um, partnership, which we call the Grand Bargain, of near of a little more than $800 million, which uh, helped save our um, city-owned institution of arts, as well as preserve pensions and, uh, to a degree, satisfy the creditors. You'll hear from our co my colleagues on the stage who will tell you more about that. But we've also seen some decreases in crime. Uh, we've seen significant reinvestment in our city, uh, in the downtown and the surrounding areas, as well as uh, new restaurants, businesses, entrepreneurs, uh, and a, a large increase of millennials who come into our community. So we're feeling really good about the potential of what can happen in the city of Detroit. But we also know that just like the um, decline in our city, which took, quite honestly, uh, decades to occur, that our true comeback is also going to take some time to create. So we're going to explore Detroit's story from um, uh, pre-bankruptcy pre all the way until post-bankruptcy until today. So uh, I want to just let you know who is on the stage with me. Um, so to my left, your right, <laughs> uh, Kevin Orr. Uh, who is a former emergency manager um, for the city of Detroit and who really ushered us through um, and uh, through the bankruptcy and had done a marvelous job. Detroit would not be where it is without him being courageous enough to take on, um, I think, the worst job in America at the time. Uh, so thank you, Kevin. Uh, next to him and next to me, you um, will see Judge Gerald Rosen. And Jer Jerry, uh, the judge really played an, an important role. He really was the mediator um, and brought all of the various parties together during the bankruptcy and did all of the hard and tough, uh, ugly, sticky work <laughs> between the actual official proceedings. Uh, he did a masterful job, so much so um, his job enhanced us by 800 plus million dollars. So he's really the architect of the grand bargain and I'm sure he'll mention that. And uh, to my right, your left, is Sandy Barua. Sandy is the head of our local chamber of commerce. Uh, and Sandy literally has his hands in anything that's economic. So he knows where um, the investments are coming. He's giving direction to that, and as well as direction to our businesses about how we take uh, over or how we really maximize this opportunity um, of the economic investments that's happening in our city. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it to the gentleman to help set the stage. I'm going to first turn it to uh, Kevin, who is going to take us through a few slides. Sure. If we could just have the slide deck up, what I'll try to do this morning very quickly um, is sort of show you graphically an image of the city's transition during the time that I was there. And what's depicted here is Detroit today. Um, Detroit has five major infrastructure projects at least ongoing as we speak. What you see in the upper left-hand corner is M1 Light Rail. You have the new uh, Illich Stadium for the Detroit Red Wings that's going in, a $600 million spend 
Uh, down below is a great skyline of Detroit. There is the spirit of Detroit. But over on the left is a depiction of one of the uh, developments. There are going to be five new neighborhoods that are going to be built in adjacent to uh, in Midtown and adjacent to the stadium. And we have the bridge by which Canada is going to be spending somewhere in the neighborhood of almost $3 billion to build the greatest crossing in our trading partner, Canada, from Gander, Newfoundland down to Windsor. We're actually north of Canada. We're also going to have a U.S. welcoming center on the other side. But if we could have the next slide, um, what you'll see is sort of a depiction that all too often drove the narrative of the city, that the city was, as, as Dan Gilbert of Quicken Loans, one of the great patrons of the city, calls it blight porn, uh, where all of the papers wanted to drive this narrative of the city and how it would never come back. Um, it was destitute. The people were not going to be supportive of the effort, and this would not happen. If we could go next. And so we, we moved away from that, but let's just talk briefly about how we got there. Next slide, please. Um, Detroit's decline is a combination of a number of factors, demographic, economic, behavioral, but the, the gist, the, the, the genesis of it is population decline. The city was built for 2 million people. It's 139 miles square, 141 miles, including city and lakes. It's a city bigger than Boston, Manhattan, and San Francisco combined. That's the physical footprint. It was originally designed for 2 million people and peaked out in 1950 with one point, roughly 1.9 people. Since that time, uh, the city declined to about 700,000 from the years 2000 to 2010. It lost almost 25% of its population. Roughly 250,000 people left the city, an average of 25,000 per year. So the population decline, tax services, uh, support, economies of scale, drives the balance sheet issues that manifest themselves in a number of different ways. Next, please. A number of different ways. Um, but also, it's the debt service. Um, legacy costs as a percentage of debt service were pretty much on par up until 1985 or so. And some of the costs you see in the uptick in, in uh, Mayor Archer's administration really focus on capital expenses, expenses that were designed to drive revenue and therefore are justified. But what you see starting in the late 1990s and 2000 is a huge explosion of debt for legacy costs, principally pension expense, $1.5 million in cash by which the city had really no plans as to how they were ever going to pay that debt back. That was actually cash money that was given to the city, supposedly to fix pension underfunding at that time, but unfortunately was not used the way it should. Next, please. Loan to the city. Yeah, loan, well, loan to the city, as, as we say. At very, it ended up being given at the end. Um, <laughs> it wasn't we, the intent. The, the, the other demographic that really drives it is the ratio of active duty workers to retirees. For many times, that was roughly 2.5 to 1. We see it switching over in the early 90s, and it became 1 to 2.1, more or less. More active retirees. We actually have some in the neighborhood of 9,300 employees now, 21,000 pensioners and others. Next, please. Uh, so we just look at our, when we came into the city, short-term cash flow. That means the ability of the city to pay its deals, uh, pay its bills on a current basis. Because of deferrals, that is payments we were supposed to be making roughly $600 million, for which we gave back 8% script, the city was cash flow positive, the dark blue line, only in paper. The light blue line actually shows you the real condition of the cash flow of the city, which means that it was below the line. It was borrowing to pay as operational debt and was not flowing cash flow positive. Think of it this way. You have to pay your mortgage, your rent, uh, your car note, your insurance, and you're borrowing on your MasterCard month after month to make those payments with no foreseeable, no foreseeable basis to either increase your income or to find a way to pay it off. That's what the city effectively was doing. Next slide, please. Um, you'll see that our percentage of legacy costs were going to spiral out of control. And basically, these legacy costs, everybody talks about bond debt. They talk about pensions. The single largest cost, we had $18 billion of debt all in. We had $10 billion, which was secured, which we were going to pay. But of that $8 to $9 billion, $2 billion was general obligation bond debt. $3.5 billion was unfunded pension obligations. And sometimes you say these numbers and you get used to them. But I'm talking about $3.5 billion for which we had no plans to pay it. Single largest portion of the debt was $6.7 billion of retiree health care. And in 2013, 40% of the city's general fund budget, $1 billion or $400 million, was dedicated to legacy costs, principally debt service and pension underfunding and health care. By the year 2023, 73% of the budget, 730 over, 100, over $1 billion, was going to be de dedicated to legacy costs. You could not run the city. And the reason this is important, and this is the analysis that we did when we got there, you look at a city as an enterprise, 9,000 workers, but 3,000 over at enterprise funds doing parking, water department, 
um, principally 36 district court, the inner end Department of Transportation. Enterprise funds are funds supposed to fund themselves. Of the 6,000 workers that were on the civil side, over 4,000 or 72%, 2,715 in police, 1,100 in fire, 400 EMTs, and put 36 district court back in, roughly 4,200 were involved in the public safety space. So the city's product line, if you will, using, using private sector parlance, was to produce services for public safety. And as you may have read, we weren't doing that at that time particularly well. So when we examined the city, what is it supposed to be doing for the traditional covenant between a municipality and its taxpayers? We take in tax dollars, revenue, and other things, and we're supposed to push out this product. And by the year 2023, if we weren't doing it with $600 million, there was no way we're going to be able to do it with uh, $270 million by the year 2023. Next slide, please. So the restructuring process, we initially thought we could do it, next please, we could, we could do it by um, uh, cooperation. That turned out to be untrue. <laughs> so when we filed the bankruptcy, uh, things got a little testy. Please go on. Uh, some of you may have read it. Uh, there were folks, there was this guy named uh, Kevin Orr, the emergency manager, apparently he had <laughs> horns and a tail. Um, and a bulletproof vest. And a bulletproof vest and security <laughs> detail. Many folks, not many folks were giving us much credit for having an opportunity for a success. And quite frankly, when we went in, uh, I had my own questions about how it was all going to turn out. But we had, you know, we, in, in the old Viking parlance, we had landed and burned our boat, so we only had to go in. We only, there was only one way to get home, and that was to go forward. Next, please. Uh, this is just a graphic depiction of the debt before the restructuring and after. And you see the total liability is $18 billion. But in the third column, what you'll see is how we restructured the debt. In the fourth column, the general takeaway is that we reduced our unsecured liabilities at eight to nine million dollars by 75 percent. We sized it to the point that we think the city going forward could afford to pay it. Next slide, please. We reduced our legacy costs. This is the prior slide. The red bar shows you where the city is now, that our legacy costs are 11 percent of general fund budget as opposed to 73 percent. In other words, a 62 percent spread in terms of legacy costs that we were going to have to pay. Next, please. Um, Principally, a large portion of this was retiree health care. Unlike some municipalities who went through this and decided they were going to get out the retiree health care business and they were going to make a lump sum payment and then leave the workers to themselves or to the Affordable Care Act, we felt very strongly that we had an obligation to these workers, many of whom have done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. They, they, they did their time with the city. They were told they're going to have health care. They're now septuagenarians, octogenarians going on in their life, and they have no way to address this problem. They're not going to go back into the job market. So we borrowed a structure from uh, uh, General Motors bankruptcy and Chrysler's bankruptcy, which we had some work with called the VIBA, Voluntary Employee Benefit Associations. And we will fund health care for our retirees by $22 million for the next 20 years so that they are not left alone. And two VIVA trusts, one for the civil side, one for the public safety side, will manage their health care uh, benefits and their health care spend going forward. But the main focus here is that the city did not leave its retiree employees out health care, but it did ring fence the city away from spiraling out of con control costs. Next, please. Here's just a graphic depiction of the, the uh, classes of creditors. We had 17 classes of creditors. When I came in, many people were saying, you know, that he's going to take care of the bond creditors and he's going to leave the people behind. The takeaway here is that actually the creditors were the ones who were hardest hit. The financial community, the funded debt. The pensions is, is really depictive of, of what we tried to do fairly and the different classes of creditors. Can we go to the next slide, please? But also, People were saying, you're going to ruin the city. You're going to ruin its credit rating. It's never going to come back. It's not going to be able to go to the capital markets. We did three bond issuances in bankruptcy. And the reason this is important is when we started to show the, the creditor community, the funded debt community, that we were behaving in a more orthodox and financially responsive way, they were remarkably receptive and responsive to that. The reason it's so important is on every billion dollars of debt, for one point, that's $10 million. Over 10 years, that's $100 million. So if you're paying four points above the VIG, what you should be, you're paying $400 million. And that's significant in city needs public safety. Next, please. We're just going to go through, if you just roll through these, please. So finally, we went through the bond issuances. Moving forward with the city, we'll take a quick look. We got it done. There's some usual suspects down here in the corner, uh, <laughs> one of whom is on the stage with me who managed to put to the grand bargain. Judge Rosen is going to do with that. Next, please. Uh, we went on, and, and successes has many fathers, failures, and orphan. 
Uh, fortunately for the city, uh, we thought that we had fairly uh, conservative and accurate uh, forecasts. The city is exceeding those forecasts in less than a year. Next, please. Um, keep going, please, if you will. Uh, bottom line is we now have a stable bond rating. Um, the city is able to go to the capital markets in a competitive way and drive down its debt. Next, please. Um, the city is growing. People are actually coming back into the city, and whether it's trendification, yuppification, so on and so forth, that's a good thing because we're starting to reset the footprint. Next, just, let's just roll through them. And this is a depiction which Judge Rosen will talk about, about the grand bargain. We have many corporate partners. Goldman Sachs was there helping us out with 10,000 small businesses. Next. Jamie Dimon over at J.P. Morgan Trust, with J.P. Morgan Chase. Next, please. And many of our uh, uh, philanthropic organizations were involved, in tune with Kanye, who's with Skillman Foundation, but others. If we could just scroll, th scroll through all of these as we go through it, um, that helped us get through it. The long story short, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the biggest question that we're always asked is, how is this going to occur? It occurred through the efforts of many people in a collegial way. Most of them on, uh, are up here on this stage, their leadership and their guide, but there's one thing I always say. Uh, when we talk about this, and, and this is probably the thing that I think shows most, the best thing about Detroit. The people of Detroit were being importuned to act in an uncivil way, and as we've seen in several instances in recent years, that is at a flashpoint. It can happen overnight. They did not take the bait. They behaved with dignity, a sense of honor, and they soldiered through a very volatile season. If you go back through the, the era of Miracle Patrick's administration, the people of Detroit dealt with turmoil and trauma for almost a dozen years, and they did not have civil unrest. And for that, I will always compliment them and be very thankful for their assistance and tolerance for the time that we were in the city. So that's my presentation. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Judge Rosen, can you talk a little bit about the public-private partnership? And I think the audience would be curious about, do you think this is, um, replicable. Can other communities that are facing pretty significant financial challenges, can they do this kind of heroic action too? You know, I'd like to spend, yes, I will, uh, but I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what animated the need for it, uh, Tanya. When I first got the assignment as the uh, judicial mediator in the bankruptcy, uh, it was a daunting task, but I really didn't know how bad it was until I really started digging into it and reading uh, a stack of background materials that I brought with me on a supposed golf trip down with my son down to Florida. And it was, the stack was about this high. And it included uh, Kevin's proposal for creditors, which was much more than a proposal for creditors. It was a dissection of Detroit's failed economic and uh, human services past. Um, Municipal bankruptcy experts were talking about Detroit as being service delivery insolvent. That's an antiseptic term, which means that for the people of the city, the residents, the businesses, the visitors, people who worked in the city, the city really wasn't a city at all. Kevin has talked about some of the financial issues and challenges, but beneath the staggering debt total of 18 plus billion dollars, were the human costs of its subparts. Uh, the city had stopped making contributions to its pension plan. It couldn't fund health care. Public safety services were virtually non-existent. The average runtime for response to police calls was an hour. The national average is less than 11 minutes. Yeah. I could go on and on. 60% of all of the city's 90,000 streetlights were out and the copper wire innards necessary to fix them had fallen victim to scavengers. So my job as the mediator was to get, and I should add there was 150,000 blighted homes and vacant lots, many of which were housing squatters and uh, were homes of prostitution and crack houses. Uh, and the city just had no plan, realistic plan to address it. So. As the mediator, my job was to put the pedal to the metal because the only way that things were going to improve was to get through this bankruptcy quickly. Um, that, sounds, that, that sounds harsh, but nothing was going to improve with time. And Judge Rhodes and I agreed right from the beginning 
that time was the enemy and we had to do this quickly, which meant we had to do it through consensus. Years of scorched earth litigation would have left the city with nothing but dust. The only ones who would have profited were the lawyers and the financial experts that were working on the case. So my job was to get deals. Uh, Steve Rhodes, or the judge in the case, had the front room and I had the back room. And I will never forget sitting down with Kevin's proposal for creditors and going through it. And to get deals, of course, you have to have assets and revenue. There were no assets. I, I got to the asset section and it, the cupboard was bare. And negative. I, it, negative assets. Negative. Yeah. I, I remember thinking to myself, what in the hell have I gotten myself into? <laughs> My job is to get deals. We've got nothing. The city had one asset that was readily liquidatable, and that was the iconic, world-renowned, really, art collection owned by the Detroit Institute of Arts, which itself was owned by the city. That was it, and all of the creditors wanted to, in the bland parlance of municipal bankruptcy folks, monetize it, which means liquidate it. Sell it. Sell it. And I remember thinking, you know, this is great. My legacy is going to be that I was the one that helped preside over the liquidation of an iconic world-renowned art collection of Renoirs, Rembrandts, Bruegels, Van Goghs, Cezannes, and the incredible industrial murals of Diego Rivera, and sold them to sheiks in Dubai and oligarchs in Russia. So I began to think about how we could monetize this asset without selling it, without liquidating it. Pretty good trick if you think about it, but I began to think about it, and then I began to think about the bankruptcy as being bookended by the art on the one hand and the retirees, the human capital and the human cost of the retirees on the other hand, and how we could monetize the art to benefit the retirees and insulate them from the really draconian pension cuts that would have been necessary fiscally um, and, and help them. Um, I thought that the financial debt, for all the reasons that Kevin has talked about, was very important on the other side of the bankruptcy so that Detroit would have a stable bond rating. Um, but the immediate problem, the immediate problem was to address the retirees. So one morning I was sitting at the dining room table in this condo I was staying at, and I drew a little doodle after talking to a lot of the representatives of the creditors, um, and I drew a doodle. In one oval I wrote state, <coughs> in the next oval I wrote art, and in the next oval I wrote pensions. By the way, I'm a compulsive doodler. I don't know how many of you are, but <laughs> it helps me think. Uh, and uh, then um, I drew arrows from the state to the art and from the art back to the retirees, to the pensions, with dollar signs. Then I drew a square around the art to indicate that we were gonna lock the art off after monetizing it from all of the other creditors except for the retirees and give whatever money we could raise, monetize, give it to the retirees to insulate them from these really draconian cuts. And then I got up and got a cup of coffee and went back and I thought, well, this is a pretty crazy idea. And I wrote down a whole list of questions below that, such as how much, what's the timeline, what kind of legal structure would be required to insulate the art and make the transference. The idea in writing the state was that the state would kick off the funding. So I also wrote down other sources of funding including foundations mm -hmm. and the DIA itself uh, and private, private donors, just corporations. And uh, I have to say that my old friend, the governor, who had worked for me uh, about 33 years before. Just for the record, everybody works for Judge Rosen. <laughs> <laughs> um, my initial conversations with him were not fruitful. Um, he had made it clear that there would be no, quote, bailout of Real Detroit. Life. So I turned to the foundation community to kickstart the funding, and the real heroes, the real heroes were the foundation community. And here I have to single out a few people. Tanya contributed, I, Tanya, the Skillman Foundation, 
and many others, but really, I, I have to talk about Miriam Nolan of the Community Foundation, who I met at the deli across the street from the courthouse, and she asked me if she could help. I said, funny you should ask. And less than, less than three weeks later, she had the presidents of 13 major foundations yeah. in the courthouse, and we made a presentation to them. And Darren Walker, Darren Walker was a brand new president of the Ford Foundation, and the Ford Foundation had had a very fractured relationship over the decades with both Detroit and the Ford family and uh, the Ford community. And I met with Darren, and we talked about how Ford could reconnect with Detroit in a meaningful way. And Darren kicked off the fundraising, and I will never forget the phone call I received from him sitting at my desk when he called me to say that Ford was in for $125 million. And I got an email from my friend Rip Rapson, whose picture you saw as well, and Kresge was in for $100 million, and they had obviously orchestrated that. And within about two days, I had $282 million, and it was time to go back and talk to the governor again. And, uh, Some of the largest donations ever in the history of the It was, for all of these organizations, it was, the largest single grant, programmatic grant they had made in their history. Uh, Alberto Iberguren of the Knight Foundation. Uh, I mean, it was just remarkable. And I went back and I met with Rick, uh, the governor, and I said, you know, Rick, you made a very courageous decision. It was the right decision to put Detroit into bankruptcy. It was a decision that all of your predecessors had avoided and kicked down the road. But you can't throw up your hands now and say, not my problem. Um, I said that uh, we can't liquidate the museum. History would never forgive us. So I said to him, uh, I said, Rick, and now the foundation is come, community is coming in. And he said, well, tell me about that. And I had gotten permission to share with him these, at the time, these were not public numbers at all. And I opened this, I opened this uh, portfolio that I had, and I was keeping a tally sheet. And I said, Ford is in for $125 million. And he was sitting right next to me, closer, mm -hmm. closer than Kevin is. And he looked at me and he said, really? <laughs> Just like that. He's got, already, he's got a fairly high-pitched voice. But he was surprised. And I said, yeah, and Kresge's in for $100 million. He said, really? And we talked. And I said, I have to tell you, Rick, that all of this money is conditional upon the state participating in a significant way and the DIA. The foundations have made it conditional. So, uh, you know, you've got some incentive here. So the conversation immediately turned to how we could do this. And he said, he's a pretty shrewd negotiator, he has a substantial business background, and he said, you know, if I go to the legislature with an ask, he asked me how much I thought we were going to get to. I said I thought we'd get to about $350 million because we had some foundations still out. And, uh, I said, I think we're going to get to $350 million. I, I didn't know. I took a shot. In fact, we got to $370 million. Mm -hmm. He said, if I go to the foundation, he said, if I go to the legislature, he said, uh, you can't retrade me. You're going to have to make it work. Do you think you can? And I said, we'll make it work. We'll get some money from the private sector. He reached over, and we shook hands. And uh, then about uh, four weeks later, he got a $100 million pledge from the DIA. So that was the 820. We actually got 370 million from the foundations. Great. So thank you, uh, Judge Rosen. So one of the things that. Um, By the way, the the little sketch I did, the doodle, is now hanging in the DIA. Right. <laughs> my grandmother, who was my grandmother, who was a fairly accomplished artist, would be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So obviously, philanthropic capital plays um, an important role in what has happened in Detroit. But really, um, I think this part of Detroit that's been most amazing is that, um, that it, there is the private capital that's coming in, and it is not charitable. This, these are real investments yeah, that right. people are getting returns on, expecting Absolutely. returns on, and we're marketing our city to young people across the world who believe that Detroit is an affordable place to be and a place where they can actually make a mark. So, um, Sandy, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about that? Uh, and then we'll jump to what are the challenges still before us? Sure. So, happy to. Uh, 
there's really kind of three things that I should probably touch on. Uh, one is, uh, is is the private investment piece, which which is critical. Uh, but the two other issues are alignment, and as Jim Collins would say, confronting the brutal realities. So uh, unlike uh, Tanya and and Judge Rosen, uh, I'm not a Detroiter. Uh, I am I am an import uh, to Detroit. I've uh, been in town about uh, about five and a half years. And uh, as someone who you know, uh, worked primarily in Washington, D.C., I'm, I'm a reformed political hack, uh, <laughs> but lived in Portland, Oregon, Michigan was definitely flyover country and a great place to change planes. <laughs> but my last gig, uh, my last uh, government gig, uh, and by the way, I think there's some of my former uh, U.S. Department of Commerce uh, colleagues in the room, so a shout out to my old EDA team, uh, was I was the administrator for the Small Business Administration for President Bush. Uh, during the financial crisis. And I was put in charge, uh, along with uh, Secretary Paulson and others, you know, Hank was the lead, on working on the auto bailout, the early days of the auto bailout before the Obama administration took over. And that was my introduction to Detroit. What I learned on the ground in Detroit at that time was the power of alignment, or frankly, the power of lack of alignment. Uh, my previous agency, the Economic Development Administration, uh, even though we knew that uh, uh, that portion of Michigan was in desperate need. We had a hard time uh, doing investments in that region because of the lack of alignment. And what you heard from Kevin and what you, what you heard from Jerry wa and what you hear from Tanya is how the community came together and overcame, frankly, decades of disalignment to allow all of the good things that have happened uh, to, to actually, actually happen. So the power of alignment is a hugely critical piece. The second thing I want to talk about is, is the power of confronting your brutal realities. Kevin did a masterful job, you know, obviously today, kind of outlining in, in a speed read fashion <laughs> everything that happened. But, you know, as someone who was then new to the Chamber of Commerce and new to the Chamber of Commerce profession, a lot of folks in town, and we represent not just the city of Detroit, but the 11 counties around, uh, around Detroit, people came to us and said, listen, what are you going to do to sell the city? And this was before bankruptcy, before emergency management. And our answer was, not a damn thing. We are not going to try to sell the city of Detroit. We're going to put our energy into fixing the city of Detroit so we have a better product to sell. And the analogy I used, and it worked much better in about you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, after the auto industry really revived, is when I would speak to a group, you know, a group of people, you know, I, I, uh, especially outside of Michigan, I would say, how many of you all have a better opinion of Ford Motor Company, I could have used General Motors or Chrysler, but how many of you have a better opinion of Ford Motor Company today than he did X number of years ago. And invariably, you know, other than you know, the, 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 the Chevy people in the room, everyone raised their hand. Oh, I think Ford's doing a lot better now. And I'd ask people, said, do you think that was because Ford had better marketing today than they did five years ago? Or do you think that they just built a better car than they did five years ago? And of course, it's because they built a better car. And it's true. And the same thing about General Motors. That was the principle that we applied to the city of Detroit. And that's why, as a business organization, we were uh, one of the leading voices working with the governor to, one, pave the way for emergency management and to pave the way for bankruptcy. And uh, you know, we'd like to think that you know, our voice being very loud about saying that, yes, bankruptcy is going to be difficult. Yes, the reputation of our city and state and region is going to take a hit. But it's like surgery. Either we do it now and we do it quickly, or we just delay the inevitable. Let's do it now, so let's fix the fundamental problems. And that whole idea of confronting our brutal realities uh, has paid off magnificently because you're seeing the growth. And the third thing, and this is where Tanya really wants me to go, is about investment. One of the most important things to understand about the city of Detroit's revitalization is that it started before Kevin and Jerry and others did all their magnificent work. Kevin referred to Dan Gilbert, uh, who you know, is the head of Quicken Loans and the empire of companies, invested heavily in the city of Detroit. But it wasn't just Dan Gilbert. The private sector was already speaking prior to emergency management and bankruptcy. 
companies were investing in the city. And as bankruptcy unfolded, it allowed, it kind of gave the green light to outside investment. And that's one of the things that we look for. A lot of the investment that occurred prior to bankruptcy, which was critical, absolutely critical, for the city and for the region and for the state, was what I call friends and family money. It was people who knew the city, had an invest previous investment or tie to the city. What the city was lacking prior to bankruptcy was investment from Chicago and Shanghai and other places around the planet. We are now seeing that. So you take the alignment piece, we had it, I mean, I'm sorry, we didn't have it, and now we have it. And again, it was thanks to the good work of, of Jerry and Judge Rosen and Judge Rhodes and Kevin and the governor and the mayor uh, who, who helped us achieve the alignment between the public sector, the philanthropic sector, and the private sector, all having a common agenda. Absolutely critical. Wasn't the case beforehand. Secondly, confronting the brutal realities. Not treating this as a PR problem, but treating this as a fundamental systemic problem that needs to be fixed before we can actually do it. In other words, you know, don't try to sell a Pontiac gas tech. Just make a better car and, and then market that. And then thirdly, really welcome uh, uh, and set the stage for outside investment. Thank you. So I would just say I, we're getting close to the end of our session, and I want to open it up for questions. Um, but I think the, this notion of facing the brutal reality is true in every single of these stories. And um, one of the things I would say before I uh, turn it to uh, Judge Rosen in one second is that we still have some pretty significant challenges in Detroit that we're trying to face. So what we're seeing really is um, a tale of two cities in a lot of ways. Uh, and what we have to do is to figure out how it no longer stays as two cities, but really merge it as one. And that we really make sure that the opportunity is spreading throughout the city to people who have been there, legacy Detroiters, as well as those new energetic Detroiters who are bringing ideas and energy to the city. And places that we're gonna have to tackle, and I'm not even gonna go into big detail, but blight, um, we have made great progress on it, but we still have a tremendous amount of blight because we have a significant um, number of um, homes that are vacant. Our education system continues to be uh, the lowest urban performer in the country. Safety has decreased pretty, I mean, safety has increased pretty significantly, but we were one of the unsafest places in the country. So even in its improvement, we still have significant challenges. We have a meaningful civic leadership that's working, um, but that muscle, civic leadership, you have to work it all the time or you'll see atrophy or you'll see fatigue. Uh, and so we still have to spend time on that. And then I think the last is making sure that we're connecting everybody to the economy. Uh, and so we have some generations of folks in Detroit who have been detached from the economy and we, are still, we still need to build out these systems because they are absent. So these are big issues that I think challenge us uh, despite all of the success. Yeah, and, and I, I agree, Tanya. I mean, there's still a lot on our plate ahead of us, and we've got a great team looking at it between the mayor's team and the governor's team and the private sector and the philanthropic sector. It's amazing. Um, you know, people, I've done a lot of this as has Kevin and Sandy and Tanya around the country, and people always ask me in one form or another this question. Do you think what Detroit, what happened in Detroit during the bankruptcy is replicable? Can, are there lessons to be learned for other municipalities around the country that are facing the same kinds of challenges as Detroit? And I, I guess I think of what we did, not just in the case itself, in the mediations, getting people to come together that at the beginning of the case we're talking to each other. Um, yeah. I, I think of it as the four C's. Uh, I mean, every city, every municipality is going to have to find its own strike zone, its own grand bargain. But I think of it in sort of broader terms. And I think of first candor, as Tanya and, and Sandy said, denial is a river in Egypt. It's, it's not a solution for confronting problems. Municipalities have to confront the very difficult problems like pension underfunding. Chicago is $100 billion underfunded in their pensions with no plan 
to address them. Next, cooperation. You know, we found there was so much scar tissue from decades of adversarial relationships that it took us a while to get through that scar tissue. But once we began to focus on the real interests and the real goals and objectives, paths to cooperation and solutions began to open up. And that was really critical to get the parties, and Kevin and I had many full, frank, and candid co <laughs> conversations. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, to get the parties to cooperate and to look toward Detroit on the other side of the bankruptcy. Third, creativity. Uh, people cite the grand bargain as being the best example of creativity, maybe it was, but there were many, many other solutions that came from the parties in the case, as well as the mediators, as well as the city. Um, and we did some amazingly creative things. And every, every city, if you come together, every city can do that. And finally, I would say the last C is courage. People have to get beyond their own self-interest. They get locked in, they become rigid. And they have to show courage. Kevin is a prime example. The, ph the philanthropy community is maybe the best example. What the philanthropy community did in Detroit was unheard of, unprecedented. And sh all of them who participated showed tremendous courage. The leadership, the political leadership, uh, Governor, Governor Snyder, Mayor Duggan, showed tremendous courage. So I think the, if, if, if parties sort of get beyond the shout, the shout shows and the political infighting and begin to focus on the real issues, I, I think all of any municipality, any governance can do what we did. And I'm just so excited about the future. Without being, without being naive, uh, Wednesday I went over to see a preview from the Illich family. Uh, those of you who don't know, they own Little Caesars, the Tigers, the Red Wings, and much else. They're the ones that are putting together this $700 million development between downtown and midtown, 50 blocks. It is just awesome. It, 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 it's shocking what this city is going to, and this is committed money, what this city is going to look like. So my message to all of you here is come to Detroit and see the future. Great. Thank you. So it looks like we're out of time. Um, I don't think we're going to have time for questions. I'm sorry. So we'll think, um, leave them got, here. We've only, I'm we've getting only the signal. Oh, we've only done 40 minutes. Are we? We can do some? Yeah. Oh, we, we can? Only, okay, great. So, so then let's open it up for questions. Unless my Shinola stepped. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't Kevin, know. Kevin, are you wearing your Shinola Hello. watch? No. Pardon me? Kevin, so, are you wearing your Shinola watch? No, actually, I, I, I left it in my office. Yeah, I, 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 I noticed that. I was, I, I actually, and I, I, I was waiting for this moment well, wait a minute, in front wait of an minute, audience to raise it. I have it. two watches. <laughs> my wife and I have bicycles. I have a leather portfolio from Shinola. I have Shinola shoe polish. Okay, buy Shinola. Okay, <laughs> you don't know from Shinola. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. So, so we're gonna get these two people here standing. Um, lunch is about to be served in a couple of minutes. We just wanna make sure everybody gets a chance to get to the general session room. Um, what I'll do is I'll pass the mic here. If we can keep the questions um, to under two minutes and possibly keep the answers short as well and we can get things moving. All right, here you go, sir. Thanks, a lot of pressure there, thank you. Uh, just want to commend you on what y'all have done. Uh, I feel like I'm a cousin of Detroit. Uh, I'm from Alabama, and most of my cousins live in Detroit. My mother didn't choose to live there, but uh, I've been there often. And I've seen the, uh, the transition, I guess, over the years. And Detroit reminds me of uh, still my hometown of Bessemer as far as uh, uh, how the, the flight of people leaving and, and which give us a deficit of not having people to take care of business. But my question to you all is, Leadership, uh, we didn't discuss, or maybe didn't have time, that over the years, uh, the leadership not see or just wasn't concerned about the decline, uh, was that not addressed to get to that point? No, I, I, and I'll take, I think the leadership was, con well, the, the leadership in good faith was concerned about it. I think the one thing is something Judge Rosen said that held them back is orthodox behavior and frankly, um, political concerns. You know, I, I'm not a politician. So when I came in to talk about resetting the table on pension funding and health care, I don't have to worry about the consequences to me in the future. I'm, I'm just going to do it objectively by what it needs to be done. And so changing that perspective 
allowed us with, with those groups to have better discussions. And once we did, as Judge Rosa mentioned, it opened up. So I think there was some leadership that, that was concerned, but frankly, a, a lot of leadership wants to avoid that problem because of the potential political blowback on it, and that's unfortunate. Kasim yeah. Reed here in Atlanta uh, undertook pension reform. It took him four years, but he got it done. He just, uh, he just got it done last year. You know, one of the problems our leadership confronted was corruption. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, one of the former mayors and 40 of his associates were engaged in what can only be called a kickback scheme. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they are all now guests of the federal prison system. Yeah. Uh, the mayor, former mayor, is serving 28 years. And our current mayor has cleaned up the city tremendously. No more pay for play. So that when you come to invest in Detroit, you're not going to get hit up. It's not going to be a gatekeeping requirement. Right. Well, and I would also say this one thing quickly about leadership is I, I want to reiterate Sandy's point, and that is, is that leaders, even if they weren't the official leaders of the city, many of, the, of us started to work cooperatively. Uh, and collaboratively before the grand bargain. And so what we ended up doing was putting in the infrastructure that once we had the bankruptcy underfoot, that we had an accelerant behind the work that we were doing. And so term. it's been, it's been, you know, a tale of two <coughs> in that sense. Um, the municipal elected leaders weren't leading us in the direction that we were going, but we were seeing quite a bit of civic leadership because people were exhausted right. uh, and really feeling like we had to make a difference. That's a great point. That's a good point. Next. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to say good morning and thank good you morning. for sharing and coming out today. Um, my name is Angela O'Neill. I am a Detroit native, um, Persian high school graduate, Eastern okay. Michigan University. I've lived here in Georgia now for nearly 15 years. I am also, for the past 10 years here in Georgia, the founder and CEO of a not-for-profit organization called Men's Wear Incorporated, where MENS is an acronym for Making Employment the Next Step. We oh, provide wow. human services such as life skills, de career development, mm -hmm. and create an employment economic opportunities through access of training. Um, we've just real quick has serviced over 1,300 men here in Atlanta. I'm familiar with Kresge Foundation and I actually received their updates through their emails. Um, families and friend members are constantly asking me now that I've established such an organization here in Atlanta, when are you coming back to Detroit? I was there for Thanksgiving. I was so happy. Detroit is so clean. It looked so nice. I was so, yes, it was beautiful. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very excited about the change and because of the business model that I've started here in Atlanta, I really want Detroit to be our first affiliate. So I was hoping someone on the panel or several people on the panel could connect me or give me a direct contact. Sandy or, and I um, will talk to you after. And Tanya. Yeah, sure. we'll, 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 okay. we'll, we'll reach out to you afterwards. Okay, okay. Come on thank back you. To Washington. Right. I don't. <laughs> yeah, just real quickly. Uh, Tanya, can you tell me what your organization is mm -hmm. and the role that you guys played in uh, bringing uh, the city of Detroit back? Okay, yeah, we're a children's foundation, so we, and we may give grant dollars to nonprofit organizations. And in particular, we're investing in uh, education. So we're right now uh, in a, the second fight, I think, of, uh, of the city um, trying to get the legislator, legislature to help um, basically make an insolvent Detroit public schools, um, bring it back into the black, and that more importantly, it's the issue, not just of um, the finances. We're not delivering the product. So we're working on that as well as we make significant investments in neighborhoods um, to help strengthen and improve community leadership, youth programming, as well as safety. So your organization has the funding to provide Yes, we do. Can I just jump on the, uh, someone had talked about uh, leadership, uh, kind of two really interesting points about leadership. One, uh, you know, really during bankruptcy, we had a mayoral election. And uh, it was a fascinating election. Uh, we had a, uh, a guy who was actually on my board. He was the uh, CEO of one of the largest medical systems that's based in Detroit, uh, run against the county sheriff, who is a longtime uh, public servant uh, in our region. Uh, one gentleman happened to be African American. The other gentleman, the, the hospital CEO, happened to be uh, a white gentleman. And, you know, Detroit is a proud African-American city. Uh, I think it's the last time I checked, it was about 83% African-American was, 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 was the population. 
the, uh, the, the, the CEO, the hospital CEO, actually got kicked off of the ballot in the primary and had to run as a write-in candidate. And to make matters worse, a local barber with the same name <laughs> decided to run as well as a write-in candidate. Wait, wait, wait. He had some help wait, in wait, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit different. Mike was D-U-G-G-A-N yeah, yeah, and Mike Dudge it was D-U-N-G-E-O-N. Yeah, so yeah. people thought cynically yeah. the black residents of Detroit wouldn't spell the right name. Exactly the right. right. That's, 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 that's the point I was trying to get at. That's the point I was trying to get at. And everyone assumed that, oh, my, you know, my goodness, you know, and, it, and, and the expectations were so wrong and low. Yeah. And uh, this, the CEO, the white, you know, white CEO, uh, won. And uh, this is the uh, mayor that uh, we've all been talking about, who's doing a great job just redoing the fundamentals of, of, of the city. And, and again, it kind of got, comes back to these kind of fundamentals, conf confronting the brutal realities. Cops showing up on time, garbage being picked up, potholes being filled, snow lights being going removed, on, right. lights going. I mean, you know that kind of work. And uh, you know, if you lay that kind of groundwork, you know, you fix the finances, you do the uh, the fundamentals of good governance. That allows the type of investments that Kevin was showing on on during his slide presentation uh, to happen. Because if you don't have the first two things, you don't get uh, what Kevin showed. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to our panelists today. John, I just want to say something really. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> where, where does that leave me? Where, where does that no, leave no, me? You're, you're, you're with the tribe. You're with the tribe. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but hold on. No, no, John, John, John I gotta say one thing. Just one thing, real quick. Okay, you know how you meet someone, and you know it usually goes two different ways, right? You meet someone for the first time and say, "Wow, that person's really impressive," and then over time, it's like, "Okay, they're just a human being. They, you know, they can't walk on water." So I had the opportunity to meet Kevin. Uh, very quietly uh, uh, before it was announced that he was going to be emergency manager. March 14th. And, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I walked out saying, wow, this guy is going to be great. I'll tell you right now, my respect for Kevin Orr is higher right. than it was the day I first met him, and he blew me away the first day I met him. So, Kevin, you thank you so much for everything you did. Thank you. and famous those whose only credential is to be famous <laughs> as a celebrity. <laughs> They've never done a thing. Right. But they get on reality TV and say some crazy stuff and <laughs> all of a sudden they, everybody wants their, their autograph and what have you done? This man has, most people don't know is that he don't care. He don't need you, but he has changed America, yeah. and he's walking amongst us. You have a chance to meet him, build a relationship with him, and then you have this sister down here who just is absolutely incredible, who's running the, one of the largest foundations in America, the Skillman Foundation, but if you run across her in the street, 
she's so humble, she's so sweet, she's so understated, but don't underestimate her, she'll, she'll hand you your head. <laughs> but time to time, she ain't playing, and I mean ain't on purpose, ain't, I know English, she ain't playing. And she's serious about helping her babies, kids in Detroit. And I'm honored to say if we go deeper in Detroit, we're only going to do it as an anchor partner with the Skillman Foundation under Great. Tiny's leadership. And all the standing, we started with Sandy Rua, who was with the EDA, now running the chamber, who has reimagined what a chamber is. It's not a place you come to for cocktails and snacks. Well, let's not completely club. dismiss the cocktail part. <laughs> it's not a country club for business people who want to exclude themselves from everybody else. It's an engine for economic growth and prosperity and job creation. And Sandy really is being commended by leaders of chambers around the world as a model leader. I think that's right. And last but not least, uh, you, you Again, you're not an honorary black man. You're just a rich white man. But, but <laughs> my, my wife would differ. But, <laughs> but how'd you get so rich, Jerry? <laughs> Judge Rosen. Judge Rosen. File. You know, you go to court, you get a filing for this and a ticket and a this, and maybe unfortunately a divorce or a wedding or <laughs> you know, you go to court. Judges do all kind of stuff. Right? Judges do all kind of stuff. Hold on. The man filed for the bankruptcy, structured the bankruptcy for Detroit, worked with Kevin to make sure that it was structured to win through the process, and then engineered the exit of the bankruptcy for the largest bankruptcy in American history. This man engineered the exit, the entry, but more importantly, the exit. He is like a framer of the American economic constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Jerry. Congratulations. Congratulations, Jerry. <laughs> Ladies, that may be the greatest honor I've had since the end of the bankruptcy. I had to, Thank I had to, you, John. I had to fly home with him, and his ego is not going to be able to sit next to me. So thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.